Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. In 1972, women in movies made by men were most often dumb, domestic, or blonde bombshells, whatever the real color of their hair. Women Make Movies as an organization was founded that year to have women make movies about women as human beings, neither sexist or racist. Since 1983, Deborah Zimmerman has been its executive director, and this nonprofit feminist media organization has grown into the largest distributor of films and videotapes by and about women in the world. And that's quite an accomplishment. <laughs> Thank you. It's great. Tell us a little bit about Women Make Movies. Well, as you said, we were founded in 1972, so we're coming on our 40th anniversary. Um, we distribute more than 500 films made by women directors from all over the world. Uh, we distribute to audiences in North America, in Canada, the U.S., sometimes Mexico. Um, <laughs> we distribute films about every subject under the sun to theaters and cinemas and museums and universities, colleges and the home audience, and we have some films up on iTunes. Um, we also have a production assistance program where we help um, women to get get their films made through a production assistance program, and we've got about 200 films in that program. That's mostly that's very difficult, isn't it, to get the money? Funded. Very, very, very hard. But let's go hard. back to originally. It, it was my understanding when I read about it that Women Make Movies originally was really to help women do the movies. Do the movies, absolutely. Yeah. That's why it's called Women Make, make movies. movies. And then, <laughs> but then the question became. What happens after they've made the movies, that's right. right? And that's, that's right. how you got into distribution, because that's right. it really had to have a place to go. That's right. For the first 10 years uh, in the 70s until the early 80s, something like 40 to 70 films got made collectively with a 16 millimeter camera, um, uh, all kinds of short films. Then when I came back to the organization in 83, after we had suffered some real problems under Reagan and lost a lot of funding. We, so that was all government funding? It was mostly government and funding. That, so yeah. you were dependent yeah. on it. Yeah, we yeah. were very dependent on it. Yeah. Um, and when we lost that funding, we kind of looked at the organization and said, well, you know, maybe we don't need to exist anymore. But it was very interesting. We had a bunch of community meetings, and people were saying, this was so important to me when I came to New York. It's really helped me to get my films made. And even though we barely had a staff, we were still getting requests almost every day for the films that we had made to get them shown in different settings. So um, myself and another woman named Lydia Dean Pilcher, who has gone on to be a very successful producer, she produces Mira Nair's films, for example. Um, she was a grad student at the time. <laughs> we said that we would help out and just kind of see if we could make a go of it, um, but mm -hmm. focusing on distribution rather than focusing on production. So, and so you've become, actually, you're a model for non-for-profits because you are able to almost exclusively support yourself by your sales. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Rentals. we love our funders. We have we get very nice support from New York State Council on the Arts and National Endowment for the Arts, um, Department of Cultural Affairs. But 85% of our funding is actually earned through selling and renting films and supporting women to get their films made. So do you see the women whose films you distribute, do you see them before they're made? Well, that's what the production assistance program is about, yeah. because we get involved with films from the very, very beginning. For example, this year, one of the films that was nominated for an Academy Award is a film called Which Way Home by Rebecca Camisa. That film came out of our program. Uh, so what did she film, do? She had already gotten the concept. She'd gotten the concept. She decided she wanted to make it, and she needed a nonprofit organization to be her umbrella. Oh, so she could get the money and put it through. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, another film called uh, The General, which actually is going to be on POV uh, in July, uh, and, and won a uh, Best Director Prize at Sundance, very proud to say that. Also, uh, that filmmaker, Natalia Almada, came through the program. And with Natalia, um, this was the third film, actually, that we had uh, worked with her on. So, so not only do you get, the, are you able to be the recipient of the money and the whatever you call it? The grants that come through, yeah. yeah. Uh, but you also help them guiding it, how you go and look for the money, what, In, writing yes. the proposals, we, doing all we that. We look at their proposals, we give them critiques, we look at their mm -hmm. budgets, we have workshops and seminars, we bring in people who are working in the industry for them to meet with. In some cases, we'll look at three to four rough cuts of the film and really get involved with the content. Oh, In so other cases, it's just a matter of making an introduction. Sometimes it's really just acting as that nonprofit kind of seal of approval. So what's the difference when women make films about women and when men make films oh, about women? Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> well, the first thing, you know, it's really interesting. I always, I always 
when people ask me about this, first of all, people are always asking me, why isn't there men make movies? And I say, well, there is. It's called Hollywood. <laughs> so that, let's get that out of the way. Um, secondly, interestingly enough, not surprisingly, um, when you look at men making films and women making films, men making films about men get the most amount of money and women making films about women get the least amount of money. But what's really fascinating is that men making films about women get less money than women making films about men. And that's very important because I think it's important to realize that it's not just the gender of the person who's making the film, but it's the subject of the film that's very important. And that's why in our distribution program, we still only distribute films that are not just by women directors, but really looking at women's issues and really looking at the world through women's eyes, because that's the perspective that we don't get to see. So that's a, basically a feminist viewpoint. Absolutely <laughs> feminist, unabashedly, proudly, absolutely feminist. And and I, when I worked in the government, I always championed and felt very strongly that there is most definitely a women's perspective in public policy. Mm -hmm. And that too often it's not reflected. We, we're not able to participate, right. but we see things very differently. Absolutely. And that is in the films too. Totally. There's a, a film called Filming Desire, which is a, a wonderful, wonderful hour-long film. I just had uh, lunch with the filmmaker last week and was reminded of it. And it's a film that looks completely at the way that women film sexual activity in the way that men do. And you'll find that it's completely different. The subjects that women choose. Um, the General is actually a really interesting example of a film that's not particularly about women. It's about the filmmaker's great-grandfather, who happened to be one of the dictators of Mexico. Um, but the way that she sees history is very much through a woman's perspective, and it's very feminist. And she tells the story of her, of her great-grandfather through her grandmother's eyes. Yeah. Um, and that's a real, that's a real so difference. Interesting. Yeah. And what kind of feeling do you get when you see these films? <laughs> well, you know, it's actually, it's funny. Somebody just asked me about kind of how I got involved with Women Make Movies and why. And the story is, is that I went to a weekend, a women's weekend back in the 70s when we were just exploring all the things that we could do. And I sat in a barn and I watched these women from Women Make Movies show a film and I realized that I was sitting in an audience with only women. And it was one of the very first times that what I saw on the screen actually reflected my perspective. Um, and it was an extraordinary feeling. Um, it's really what made me so passionate about the work that I do. It's, the, um, it's also the basis of consciousness raising, I think, it right? It is, sure. It's exactly, Absolutely. yeah. And, you know, it's one of the, liberating once you see them and realize it. Exactly. One of the nicest things about my job, besides the fact that I get to travel all over the world and get to meet extraordinary mm. women filmmakers, is when I travel and I'm sitting on a plane and I'm sitting next to a college student and they say to me, oh my God, I saw women make movies, films in my class, and they changed my life. <laughs> because films do that. They, they reflect the world to us. They reflect back. Um, our dreams and our desires and I think that's one of the reasons why men have really held on so tightly to creating those to creating those images because you know what if I was in if I was in power and I had the ability to just <laughs> put on the screen what made me get hot I would too the difference is they that would that all what be makes women. me <laughs> what makes what 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 excites me both intellectually um, and emotionally is very very different than I think what excites men that Hollywood is supposed to be so tough, yet we have increasingly, I mean, over the years, more women producing. Absolutely. And even studio heads, That's right? That's right. That's right. Does it get reflected in what they produce? <laughs> That's, a, that's an interesting question. And some of question. them really are feminists, I think. I, I think many of them are, but yeah. I don't think that many of them can be in their positions. I think the problem is, is that we've never had the number, the quantity, to really enable them to make significant changes. When you're the only feminist in a room, it's really hard to get your agenda forward. Um, even if you're the one in, in, oh, it in is. power. You have to talk louder and smarter and Absolutely. faster. And, and you know, Hollywood is that amazing amalgam of money and art. And when those two things come together, it gets really tough. I mean, look at the museums. It's the same thing for- Curating and, for women and, and showing. And, yeah. And for film, it's really, from the very beginning to the very end, you're looking at an extraordinarily male-dominated structure. Critics are men. Producers are, even though there's lots of women, mostly men. Um, distributors, mostly men. Festival directors, 
mostly men. So the people that choose your films to go into the festivals, in fact, there was just a big outreach over the Cannes Film Festival this year, that even though Catherine Bigelow won in Hollywood la this past year, there were no films by women in competition at the Cannes Film Festival. And when you look at who's choosing the films for the three different sections of the festival, there's not one woman. Surprise, surprise, there are no women's films showing. I did, I, I've had some uh, experiences with Hollywood, I mean, very little. But they have a lot of meetings. I do. <laughs> and, yes, they and do. And at the meetings, I mean, it starts really early because at the meetings, yeah, that's true. You have to start the convincing of the men, right? That's right. It's, well, you know, the, the funny thing, a lot of one thing that a lot of people don't know about Hollywood, is that there were more women working in Hollywood in the teens and the early twenties than there ever have been to date. And back before Wall Street got involved in, in Hollywood, back before it was this money-making machine, there were lots of women making films, directing films, writing films. Um, Alice Guy Blachet was a woman who had her own studio, made over 100 films, and many people say that she was actually the first person to create a fiction film. When was that? In uh, 19... 17 or something okay. like that. Um, so it really is. That would this, make a great movie. Uh, well, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, I'm sure there will be one, but there's a number of documentaries that have been made yeah, about her. Right. Yeah, and there was actually an exhibit of her films, I think, at the Whitney uh, this oh, past great. year. So she's, she's really being, being rediscovered. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is that it's, it's the money that really gets in the way. Films take so much money to get made, millions and millions of dollars. Here's another interesting statistic, that when men are given the same, well, when women are given the same amount of money as men to make a film, there's absolutely no difference in the profit on the investment. Part of the problem that women have is that the budgets that they get are so much less, and the marketing budgets are based on the budgets of the film. So by the time the film is coming out, they don't have that kind of money at their disposal to spend the money, and then the films don't make as much money, and then Hollywood can say, look, no films reason. by women just don't make enough money. I'm afraid to ask this question, but <laughs> do uh, women go over budget as often, more? Oh, that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I would, I would like to hear that they come I, under yes. budget, right? <laughs> With our common sense in the use of money. <laughs> I would hope so, but I don't know if that's the case. And I, I actually really think that one of the biggest problems is that women are not allowed to fail. So I, I actually, yeah. I encourage the women do just what men do because the problem is, is that, you know, men seem to fail up and women seem to fail down. Yeah, absolutely. It's so true. And also to just be mediocre. I mean, not even to Exactly, succeed. exactly. We're so afraid. We can't be that way. We have to absolutely. excel and everything. So when the stars get as much money, the, the, the women stars are getting a lot of money, aren't they? They don't get nearly, nearly the amount of money. Nearly as much as the no, men. No, 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 And they don't get ownership or whatever it goes into Well, that's it. actually one of the things that's changing Hollywood right now. I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on that actually are very um, hopeful mm -hmm. or that make me feel optimistic. And one of them is that young actresses are understanding that in order to control their image, they have to have their own production company. And many of them, oh, like Jodie Foster, have really had impact on films getting made. That's a really, really positive development. That um, is very good. And women like Meryl Streep are showing that women can be over 40, over 50, mm -hmm. and still be attractive, especially when they have a woman director like she had in her last film. Yeah. Does um, Catherine Bigelow's winning the Oscar, has that been reflected any place? Unfortunately, I have yet to see it. In a um, way, it's negative, because no, people say, what are you negative. talking about? She won the uh, I don't think it's negative. I think it's really, it's an important accomplishment yeah. that we have to acknowledge. Yeah. I just don't think that it's changed anything. And I don't know that it actually is going to change anything except for her being given the opportunity to make more films. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember that she won it for a film that was completely the devoid of, of women, women, which was actually quite upsetting to me. Yeah, but interesting, isn't it? Very interesting, yeah. very good film. Uh, are the women um, who do succeed or in Hollywood especially, are they supportive of other women in the whole I th question? I, th I think they are to uh -huh. a certain extent. I mean, women make movies, we're much more involved with documentary. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have a lot to do with, with quote unquote stars in Hollywood. Um, but I think that if you look at New York women in film, or if you look at mm -hmm. Los Angeles women in film, and those are organizations that are more kind of trade associations, really helping women yeah. with their careers. I think you'll see yeah. that they are supportive. With your documentaries, do you find uh, television to be um, a good market? 
much more so than in the past. Ten years ago, very few of our films were shown on television. Now we just had a film on HBO, actually two weeks ago, a film called Rough Aunties about women who are working to uh, help young, young kids in, yeah. in South Africa. And as I mentioned, we have uh, The General coming up. We've got six films, actually, from our production assistance program, all showing on POV this season. That's, um, on, that's on public broadcasting. On public broadcasting, yeah. yeah. That's very interesting, because then you get funded, right? Well, it's or not... Or do they partially fund? Or do they buy it after it's made? All of those things. <laughs> <laughs> for us as a distributor, we're selling films to broadcasters. But for the films in our production assistance program, oftentimes the broadcasters are working with them and funding them to get made. And then we distribute them afterwards. So is your largest audience universities and yes, colleges? Yes, absolutely, without a doubt. Yeah. But we also distribute to prisons and hospitals oh. and cultural organizations. Actually, right now we have a... Um, a program that was funded by the Department of Cultural Affairs and we're offering um, very deep discounts on our films to any New York City community group that wants to use them in their educational programs. We work with everybody, youth groups, libraries, um, really all kinds of groups. So you're basically also organizers and activists. Yes, very, very well, important parts of that, right? It is, it is. I mean, I was, I was saying to you before that I got this funny comment, like, why don't we distribute left, uh, right-wing women's films? As if, as if we could be an organization without our politics. Our politics are really important to us. We're really trying to change the discussion. We're trying to change the tenor of the discussion. We're trying to provide films that challenge people to think about women in a different way than they see when they turn on mainstream media, mainstream television, or, or even watch the news. I mean, there's still a huge problem in terms of how many women's voices are heard <laughs> in the news are being used as pundits. I mean, the, the, the numbers are just shocking when you think that we're, you know, 30 years into the second wave, um, when women have accomplished so much. But when you look at the newspaper or you look at the news, it's just, just so much less right. women. In 1970, in the 70s, I was on a, a, some kind of a commission or committee from PBS CPB about women in media, mm -hmm. and we timed, you know, the staff uh, yeah. had timed how many times you saw women, how many right. times the stories were about women. Right. Of course, that's always been one of the major problems in the papers and, uh, and on television, is what stories they show about women. That's it's right. It's usually that they're victims that's or right. they're perpetrators. That's right. <laughs> that's right. And it's, it goes back to the blonde, you know, yeah. the good woman, the bad woman. Right. You know, one of the things that, that I actually found most disturbing about Catherine Bigelow's film, actually, frankly, is the fact that it was very much um, actually continuing the stereotypes about war. That if you mm -hmm. just watched her film, you would never know that women were fighting uh, in Iraq. You'd think that women were the women, were the people staying home in the kitchens, um, cooking while their men went off to, to fight the war. And that's just not reality. The truth is, is that today, women's lives are affected so much more by war in terms of the fact that war is no longer fought on the battlefield, it's fought all throughout communities. Um, and we don't see that. You know, we still think of war as men on Going. some sort of battlefield with a gun. That's not what war are is. There, are there a good number of anti-war movies? Anti-war movies? Yes. Mm, not so much. Interesting. Not so much. It's a different time that we're living in. Do you remember years ago, I, don't, well, I think you were too young, um, during Vietnam, there was a movie that showed boys on a football team. Uh, on the, the football field. Is the that war, what it was? War, it, was it was fight, 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 kill, 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 and then you transposed it to war. Oh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I, that I do remember yeah. the film. Yeah. And what? So, is there one major topic that films are made about? No. No, but I will. But I will tell you one of our what I think is one of our greatest successes over the last couple of years, and it's very much a film about war and the subject that we are increasingly, uh, it seems, involved with. Though we started getting involved with it mm -hmm. 15 years ago, it hasn't stopped, and that's how rape is used as a weapon of war. Mm. Um, we had a film called Calling the Ghosts, which we still distribute, which was the first film that looked at rape as a weapon of war in the former Yugoslavia. Very successful film. Um, that aired nationally, also on HBO. And in the last two years, we've been working on a film called uh, The Greatest Silence, Rape in the Congo. And it actually was mm. the first film that looked as, at rape as a weapon of war in the Congo. And the great story about that film um, is that we did a very small screening, although it showed on HBO and has had 
won tons of awards and has screened all over the place. It was one little screening where the wife of the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. came to the screening. It was held by the Open Society Institute. She brought the DVD home, or asked us to send her one, showed it to her husband. He was so moved by the film that he actually introduced into the U.N. Security Council a resolution that would give peacekeepers more uh, ability to protect the women in the Congo. And that, That's for any filmmaker... That's such an exciting yeah. and satisfying, incredible it thing. It, it, makes, it makes all the hard work, and it is a lot of hard work, work So when you, when you make a film, you really have a message, don't you, that you want to... Do you? Well, we don't do make they? films you anymore. You don't. I mean, you filmmakers, filmmakers do. Actually, actually they, we do, well, we do... You know, I just want to say that we don't only distribute documentaries. Mm -hmm. We distribute mostly documentaries. We're also very interested in women as artists who are mm -hmm. recreating the world around them. But in fact, so many the of the films... Film. Yes. But many of the films that, that we distribute do have a, a very particular perspective and are, are trying to get a message across. And you don't distribute feature films. Well, you we, would we if have, they were made, right? No, we <laughs> have in the past, and actually there's one that we're considering okay. right now. Um, they require much more money, don't they? Yes, they require more money, and we actually made a decision that if we were going to move into features, fiction features, we could only distribute maybe five films a mm. year, which is a very small number. Mm. In documentaries and in shorts and in short fiction, we can distribute 15, 20, 25. We used to distribute almost 40, release almost 40 films a year. And we felt that that was more important in terms of helping particularly American women. Because, you know, women outside of the U.S. have, had, have actually had an easier time getting their films made than they women in the U.S. They get more government support. Absolutely. Mm. The place in the world where, interestingly enough, there are the most women filmmakers. People never, I've asked, I do speaking you know, lectures and colleges yeah. in different places and ask people, just shout out what country you think. Nobody ever gets it. It's France. Yeah. And the reason why it's France is because there's no country in the world that cares more about their language and protecting their language than France. Interesting? So there's huge amounts of government support for French they film. They have great admiration for How do you pick films? Well, we uh, actually, the, most of the women on the staff are on our acquisitions committee. We, I go all over the world looking for films. We get lots of films sent to us. Um, we have a little process where one person screens it and decides yes, no, or maybe. Uh, if it's a yes or a maybe, another person has to screen it. And generally, two or three people on our staff will see it. I'm always one of those people. Um, and then we decide. So you talked about uh, film festivals. Mm -hmm. How do you? How does a person get a film into a film festival? Well, that's uh, <laughs> that's one of the things that we teach in our workshops because okay. it's very important. Yeah. And it's interesting because the kind of workshops that that we do, um, we're having a couple this this month. One is uh, bringing Carolyn Labresco, who happens to be one of our board members, and a programmer for the Sundance Film Festival. She's going to be coming and speaking to um, to anybody who wants to mm -hmm. to to come actually. And then we're doing another workshop on, on fundraising. So we're giving people kind of the, 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 the inside secrets and the, the backside of, of the industry. And with festivals, you know, it's not as simple as just submitting it. It's really, there are something like more than 2,000 festivals in the world. So trying to figure out which festival you should submit your film to and when you should submit it. And trying to find somebody that knows somebody so you could put in a good word. It's, it's a strategy. It's really a strategy. Do you have a website? We do. It's WMM.com. And it tells you all about it. And actually, Everything. it has an application form on it. It has an application a if, pre, you're interested a in, yeah. if you're interested in submitting your film for distribution, and it's got information on all of our activities. So do you have allies in your, when you said there aren't enough women on juries mm -hmm. in film festivals, do you have allies do you have people like you in other places? Absolutely. Yeah. We have, well, first of all, we have a <laughs> wonderful board of women, all of whom are, are connected in some way with the film industry or with the women's community. But somebody once told, told me that, you know, you don't need salespeople because you have every women's studies professor in the world <laughs> <laughs> advocating for you. And it's kind of the same with film festivals. When there are women programmers, um, I think they take a special interest in what we're doing. That is, that's really so important, and it just continues our thought that women are have this special perspective and appreciation of it, right? They do. They absolutely it's a, do. It's a fa what what f festival do you like the best? Is that in well, politics? Well, actually, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> the festival that, that I enjoy the most is a festival in Amsterdam. It's the largest uh, documentary festival in the world, and I've been going to, to it for many years. And more than 2,000 people involved with documentary come to this film mm. festival. And they show great films, and there's 
lots of people to meet with and I help them with workshops and I actually used to host, they do a little talk show which is kind of like this and like, I'd host it for them and talk yeah. with different filmmakers that were showing their films and it's just, it's just great fun. Are do is there a trait about documentary filmmakers? A trait? Yeah, some... They're type A personalities. <laughs> 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 they have to be to get their films right. made. And they're social activists? Most many of them. Many, many of them. them. Not all. I wouldn't right. say all of them. Again, you it's know, your artist. Yeah. There, there's. We distribute this film called "We Want Roses Too," which is a beautiful archival film that looks at um, women in the women's movement in Italy in the 1970s. Now, I mean, she is using kind of. There's a, definitely a political perspective, but it's such an artistic film. Yeah, it's, um, so it's not always kind of s social activism. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. um. It's just a. A fascinating thing. I don't remember years ago so many people going into filmmaking, or you know. certainly not women. And certainly does not. it reflect now, like at school, at Tisch Absolutely. school, are there as many women as men, or more? Well, that's, that's another or interesting is this thing. An application no, process? it's true. No, the problem. One of the problems, um, and there's a couple of different kind of very key problems, and this is one of them, is that 50 percent of the of film schools are women, but when they get out, they can't. And they have a much, much harder time. They have a harder time getting their films made. They have a harder time getting their films screened. They have a harder time, once they get their films made, getting the budgets to release them. And women tend, and I have to also say that it's not just the external, it's also internal. Women tend to go into producing rather than directing. Mm -hmm. It's more behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. They tend to go into television rather than uh, Hollywood because it's a more supportive environment. Um, so we also have to push ourselves as well as help other women to, mm -hmm. to break down some of these barriers. Well, it's a great way for us to end this half hour because if they want support or if they just don't want it and would love to have the environment, they should contact you Absolutely. at Women Make Movies. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.